Good. Listen, Helen, we've got a, a, a small but rather perfectly formed audience. Um, we are also recording, so this will be going out on, on YouTube and, um, and from where it will get um, lots and lots of views, which is, uh, which is what this is about, really. So um, thank you to, uh, to um, Leslie Ann and huge thanks to Mike for joining us. I'm going to leave you in a second and I may liaise with one or two of the audience uh, on, a, on a virtual basis to take questions etc etc so don't uh, don't go anywhere and um just a huge thank you so uh, with further ado i will uh, remove myself and leave you with the in the capable hands of mike naylor well thank you very much indeed ben and um thank you leslie ann because you've been filming i think between eight o'clock this morning and 6 p.m haven't you yeah it's been a bit of a dash to get back here on time but uh, here we are i'm raring to go yeah and well, uh, just for those who may not know, Leslie Ann's been in the world of journalism and, and uh, show business journalism for, for many years and has interviewed hundreds of the top pop stars of their day. And her previous biographies include David Bowie, Mark Bolin and Freddie Mercury. So I wondered how difficult was it though to write this one, to get new information about John Lennon 40 years after his death, when he was such a complex character and some of the major players had also passed away. You would think, wouldn't you, that there wouldn't be anything at all new to say about a character like John who died such a long time ago, but there always is. And I had specific questions that I wanted to ask about John anyway, which, you know, I, I knew the who, the what, the where and the when about his life and his death. What I didn't know was the why. Why was he the way he was? Why was he the kind of child he was? Why did he grow up to be the sort of teenager he did and then the young man, the Beatle? And why did he become the John Lennon we grew so accustomed to in later years? Nothing was really explained. All those previous biographies had told me the facts and the figures, but I knew there was more. And I felt instinctively that that information would come to me via the women in his life. And that certainly proved to be the case. Well, let's talk about some of these uh, main players in his life, shall we? We're not probably going to talk too much about the music actually tonight, but starting off with his mother, Julia, who um, you describe as a tart with a heart, and his father, Alf, who was in the Merchant Navy, hence he went away a lot and he was uh, sentenced to detention at one stage in Algeria. What, what, what were they like? What was their background? Well, so quite deprived, really. Uh, Julia came from quite a poor, but... Uh, a very proud family. There were a lot of sisters, there were five of them. Julia was the good time girl among them and she met Alf when she was a cinema usherette and he worked on the ships. He was to and fro across the Atlantic and they met early, she rejected him a few times. Eventually they got together and they married against her family's wishes. And along came John relatively quickly and then Alf disappeared back off to sea. Julia then wanted to resume her good time girl life and she gave John away to her sister Mimi who was childless and he, John... He was born in 1940 so she didn't sort of get called up to do jobs for the war effort. Well it's very interesting because she doesn't appear to have been called up Whereas the vast majority of women at that time, even women with children, mothers, there, were, there seemed to be no preclusion to why they wouldn't be called up. So there's no explanation as to why Julia didn't contribute to the war effort, but she didn't. She worked behind the bar in a pub and that's where she met her next partner, but there was no room in her life for John. So John remained with Mimi and Uncle George who tragically died when John was 15. Uncle George was the guy who brought John to newspapers and to cartoon drawing and crossword filling in and taught him various little aspects of art and creativity, which fired John's imagination. Also introduced him to children's literature. So he was reading Alice in Wonderland and the Just William stories and those kinds of books, thanks to Uncle George, Mimi's husband. So it was devastating for, for John when George died. Mm. And, and, and so he had been, he was regularly apart from, from his mother, Julia, at that time, and instead moved in with Aunt Mimi, Mary, her real name, a former nurse, into Mendips in Walton, 
quite a middle class area of Liverpool, I think. Um, she was quite strict and authoritarian. And so gradually as he was getting older and had a mind of his own, she, she he fought against her a bit, didn't he? He did, and she provided the perfect environment for John to kick against. So he <laughs> needed to, to have something to object to and to react to. And Mimi, who was quite caustic and not affectionate, and set rules and bedtimes and uh, specifics, everything was ruled regimentally. And John wasn't inclined, he wasn't that way inclined. He was more like his mother, who was much more bohemian. And when he was about 17, he resumed contact with his mom. Mm. And behind Mimi's back, he used to go around and see her with his friends. And he would eat meals there. He would sometimes stay the night, especially when he fell out with Mimi. He would sometimes disappear to Julia's for a few days. But I think all the sisters had a hand in John's upbringing, whether remotely or whether it was just a word of advice here and there. But he was certainly a maverick. He was much more like his mother than than his father at that stage. So because she was strict and he was getting older and, and was at every a teenager, he decided it was a better option to be with his mother, even though she'd rejected him and possibly neglected him. Significantly, she also taught him some chords on the banjo. Yeah. Which fired up his interest in music. And she had a gramophone and a record collection, which Mimi didn't have at home. So there were more and more reasons to spend time around at his mother's house. Um, what did Mimi do about that? How did she react? I mean, did he still have to go there to, to get a bed for the night? Well, he did. And, and Mimi wasn't very impressed, of course, because I think she felt Julia was a bit of a fly by night and that, uh, well, Mimi disapproved. At one point, she reported her sister to the council when Julia was involved with a particular chap and John, as a little boy, was sharing the bed with them. So, uh, yeah, Mimi did shop her sister. So a quite complicated dynamic going on in that family, yes. So then he's growing up uh, and it's, he passes the 11 plus, he goes to the Quarry Bank School. There he meets a lot of friends. And in fact, Julia played him, uh, uh, rather, his, yeah, his mother played, played music for him and he got interested in that. And uh, 1955, he was 15, that's when Bill Haley's film came out, Blackboard Jungle, and then uh, obviously Rock Around the Clock. So then he was getting into all of that rock and roll music as a consumer, right, and discovering it, along with people like Muddy Waters and the, the Rhythm and Blues American imports. I think it was a done deal at that point. This is what John was going to be. And John was turning into a 50s rocker, a sort of leather clad, quiffed, uh, tight jeaned, um, Cuban heeled booted, sort of, a bit of a something to be reckoned with really. There was no inkling that he would turn into a saccharine pop star at that stage. And then of course he went to art college and um, that's where he met Cynthia who was going to be his wife and he was very rude to her, very sort of dismissive of her at first and they were very much opposites. Would you like to read a, a bit from uh, the book about how she saw him? Absolutely. So Cynthia was a year older than, than John, um, but she came across quite middle-aged compared to him. She was very dressed in a very straight way, sort of almost like her mother. You know, I think uh, kids did tend to look like their parents in those days, miniature versions of them. And she was known as Miss Hoylake because that's where she lived. That's a very posh suburb of Liverpool compared to Walton where John lived. Um, I wrote here, did she want to change him? And she said to me, yes, of course, and no. I secretly adored the way he was, all the stuff he got away with. I wasn't brave enough to throw caution to the wind and behave like John did, though there were definitely times when I would have liked to. So John's behavior was a vicarious thrill for me. He was dangerous. He attracted attention in ways that I would never have dared to. There was something about him. He was irresistible. He was a rebel. He could get the attention of everyone in the room without doing anything at all. So I said, so the baddest boy in the college bagged the most butter wouldn't melt girl. What to see if he could? And she said, I don't think it was as calculated as that. There was something about being his girl 
because it was the last thing anyone expected. I confess I did bask a little in his limelight. I can't explain it really, I just did. I was shy and low key and me being with him did shock people. Being around John, being one of his inner circle made anyone more interesting. It's interesting, isn't it? Yes, well, obviously then um, he, he was able to um, sort of form a band. It was all acoustic at this stage because this is what uh, British musicians were about, really. They hadn't imported the gear of the guitars to play rock and roll too much. It was a bit skiffle orientated and he formed the Quarrymen. And as we know, what, 1957 at uh, St. Peter's Church in Walton, they played at a fate uh, where Paul McCartney came and watched and he came and in, met John and then Paul introduced George to them and they became the Silver Beatles. And another interesting man that joins the band at this stage is an artist called Stuart Sutcliffe. Now why was John attracted to him? Because he wasn't much of a musician, in fact he wasn't a musician at all, was he? He wasn't any good at all, no. He, he was an artist, he was a painter and he won quite a significant art competition. In Liverpool for which he received a significant sum of money and John persuaded Stuart to part with this money on a bass guitar because the band didn't have a bassist at that point and it wasn't yet it hadn't yet occurred to them that Paul McCartney would become the bassist and Stuart had this money so he could buy the bass guitar. Uh, I think John was a little in love with Stuart or maybe in love with his talent and I'm sure that Stu was in awe of John for all his bad ways and he was pretty impressive, he was dangerous. You know, as Cynthia said, it made anyone seem more interesting. And he Stuart... was quite with people and uh, rude and aggressive though, as well, wasn't he? I mean, he was a, a slightly wayward teenager then. Yeah, very much so, but we've all had that kind of figure in our our lives at school, for example, haven't we? And uh, if, if somebody like that admits you to their inner circle, and wants to be friends with you. That's conferring some interest upon you. And so people did want to hang around with John. They did want to be one of his chosen ones. And Stu was in that category, yeah. So we had John and Paul and Stu and, then, and George at the stage, yeah? Mm -hmm. And then the drummer was Pete Best. Now his mother was Mona Best, who opened up a, a, another sort of coffee bar called the, the Kaz Bar in Liverpool, which was really the home of beatniks and that. And, and, and Pete got the gig. Um, so that's when that lot started to play around the area, in both the cavern and the Casbah, yeah? Yeah, and the Casbah was a strange place because this was Mona Best's house. She'd bought a great big house on Hayman's Green and the Casbah was in the basement. And in fact, the boys came around to paint the ceiling and the walls and there are still to this day uh, stars and moons and, and odd shapes painted on the wall that were, were made by John and Paul and George in that place but it was they cut their teeth really in that place they played their first gigs mm. and the whole idea of them going to Hamburg to effectively do their 10,000 hours really came from the Casbah so Mona was their first unofficial mm. manager uh, but because she was a woman and because it was at that time she wasn't taken seriously and she was sidelined and, and so then Epstein stepped in straight away after Hamburg, or after the first yeah, Hamburg, trips to Hamburg, yeah, because yeah, the first because one... um, he he was working the record shop, but and he saw them at the cavern. But they 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 went to Hamburg, as you say, and there's some amazing stories about this here because they did 292 gigs, they do like five what 45 one hour sessions. They played all through the night. Um, they had groupies. They were young men in you know away from home and uh, they, they needed drugs and pills to keep them away, didn't they? They did, they were far too young to be there. Actually, the first time, the first trip out there, they were deported back home uh, for various misdemeanors. But they were living in complete squalor. And really, it was a couple who came along to see them performing, Klaus Vorman and his girlfriend, Astrid Kirscher, who improved their lives. Uh, they were taken back to Astrid's house for a bath, basically. and they looked after them, they took them under their wing and it hurt them very much to see how these boys were living, that they didn't have anyone there to look after them. So I think they were very fortunate to meet Klaus and Astrid, who remained their friends for life. And he's still alive and you went to meet him. There's a lot of interviews, a lot of his interview you've done with him there. If you want to read page 
114 really because he's, he, he says the most interesting incarnation of John Lennon for him was before they became famous. Yeah, he was, uh, he said John pretended to be a rocker, but he wasn't one really. What he was, was a very hard person. He was the first one in the band who I met and I didn't know what to make of him. I was scared, I thought he would hurt me. There was something very strong that drew me to him. He said, we were the arty people. We wore suede and leather and floaty scarves and funny hairstyles. We were very different from them. Because of the way we looked and the kind of people we were, quite deep and intense and questioning, it was difficult for us to go to those clubs, meaning the kind of clubs that the Beatles were playing at. There were always so many fights but we were fortunate that the waiters saw that we'd become friends with the band and they protected and took care of us. So we started going down to the Gross Freiheit most nights to hear them play. And then he was talking about, he got to know them because he brought along a record sleeve that he designed. And he, he said, I sat around talking with Stuart about Kandinsky, which seems such an un-John Lennon kind of subject, doesn't it? Um, even J John didn't actually enjoy this because he didn't like any scenario that wasn't directly about him. So John is very early falling into place and Klaus has the measure of him, doesn't he? But a bit self-centred, but also wanting to explore. He's like a whole series of contradictions, yes? He could be charming. Very much so, yeah, but uh, that, that is the artist, that is the creative, isn't it? Mm. It's the inquisitive mind and it's trying things. And John was never slow in coming, coming forward to try anything at all. And I think that was a whole smorgasbord going on out there in Hamburg. There was so much to try and John tried all of it. On stage, he would make fun of Hitler or send up Hitler in front of this German audience. He went on stage, I think, wearing a, a toilet seat once, didn't he? Yeah, and he would put a little comb up to wear as a, a moustache and he would insult the audience. But... The more he did that, the more they seemed to love it and come back for more. And, and Stuart Sutcliffe was engaged to Astrid Kirshner, and uh, but he died very young. And it was after, a, was it? He was punched by Lenin in a fight, and, and Lenin wondered whether he'd actually caused him to die. Mm, I don't think that that was the cause. I think he was kicked in the head, actually. And much later on, Stuart's sister Pauline did come forward and say that she wondered whether that kick to the head during a squall between John and Stuart had caused a brain hemorrhage of some kind, which may have caused Stuart to die. He was only 21 when he died. But I don't think we can pin that on John because there was never any evidence to, to sustain that argument. And what about the death of Julia? That uh, she was uh, run down by a, a policeman who wasn't insured, I think, in the car right outside the house in Mendip so that every day thereafter when he got up and looked out the window he would see the 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 the, the site of where she was died where she died and that was another blow to him wasn't it it was a great tragedy because john was around at julia's house visiting and julia had come to see mimi to say that she had to discourage john from going to visit julia because julia could no longer afford to feed him and his friends there was very little money coming in and you know boys, teenagers, voracious eaters and drinkers, and they would go around to Julia's and clear out the, the cupboards and eat the lot. And Julia had to say to Mimi, I can't do this anymore. So it was a sad visit that she had to make to Mimi. And it was as she was leaving to go back to her own home where John was, uh, she was chatting to some people on the street and then she went across the street to get her bus and she was mown down by this car. And of course, the view from John's front bedroom window was the exact spot where his mother was killed. And he couldn't believe it. He said, I lost her twice. The first time when she gave me away as a little boy. And the second time she was killed right outside my house. He never got over it. So much of his songwriting was about her. And, and he didn't know how to address the grief, as I suspect, uh, suspect a lot of people, you know, in that era, did whether they were male or female but especially it was more difficult for i guess blokes to open up it says Klaus Vormann that it took him a long many years before he felt that he got to know the real John so then the Beatles uh, then obviously were signed by Parlophone etc etc and uh, Brian Epstein came on board 
and uh, he, he obviously put them in the suits and the mop tops. He took advice, I think, from stylists about that. He'd worked in a record shop. He'd never managed a band before. But in a sense, it was a masterstroke. Now, do you th John went along with that, but I suppose the longer it went on in, you know, sort of 63, 64, 65, that's when he perhaps got a bit suffocated by fame and, and, and they were just worked so hard. They were worked incredibly hard, weren't they? Of course, and I think John did compromise himself massively to go along with that. But he saw the bigger picture. He saw that there was fame and fortune at the end of it. And there seemed something almost fait accompli about it before it even happened, almost as though they expected it to happen. And it mm. really did. But from that point on, John was compromising himself all the way through the Beatles. And that would erupt sometimes. He would put his foot in it. He almost had like a Tourette syndrome issue with, he would think of something and he couldn't hold it back. You know, there were times when he just had to spurt what was on his mind. And he very often said the wrong thing, did the wrong thing and got away with it. It was part of the charm of the Beatles that they were not like other artists, that they would turn up to a press conference chewing gum or smoking cigarettes, and they would make jokes at the expense of the interview and that kind of thing. Mm. And especially in the States, they were seen as a breath of fresh air. And also, um, yeah, because they went on the Ed Sullivan show, you had six, 73 million people. And um, I think this was also for the American audience. They were fresh, they knew they were interesting and different at a time not long after the death of JFK. So the whole country was in mourning and needed a lift. So that was partly a stroke of luck or a coincidence, but obviously the music was beginning to shine through. And um, John uh, got married to Cynthia because she was pregnant and Epstein didn't really want, he wanted to keep that quiet, which I guess he did for a spell. So in those early days of Beatlemania, Julian was around, but 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 didn't see much of his father, I imagine. No, he didn't. He didn't see much of his mother either, because she was very often travelling with John latterly. And it did shock me quite how often Cynthia left him. And with people like housekeepers and cleaners and, and those kinds of people, her own mother was living in Canada by that time. And so Julian was passed from pillar to post and he really didn't have a very functional early life. And of course, his relationship with his father went off the rails, um, was resumed quite a few years later, especially during the May Pang years. Mm. But by that time, I think it was broken and it was on the slide. Um, John poured all his love, really, his love that he would have for a child into his second son, Sean, much later. Which we'll come on to if we may, but um, obviously uh, they went to India and they, they, they met the Maharishi uh, Yogi, well, after he'd come over to Bangor University where he spoke, which is where they met him, I think. And um, there was all that. And uh, even during that, well, um, Cynthia was there, but he would slip away, Lennon, you write, Leslie Ann, to take telegrams from Yoko Ono. So at what point did Yoko Ono come into his life? John had fallen in love with another woman while he was married to Cynthia, who was Britain's first female pop star, Al McCogan. And she was very much a 50s figure in big sticky art frocks and that very sort of vivacious, voluptuous, dark Jewish style that was very popular in those days. And John used to make fun of Alma. He used to joke with Cynthia and, and mimic her. He had a great gift for mimicry and he would take off Alma Kogan. And this, all this threw Cynthia off the scent. But they'd met, he and Alma and John, at the London Palladium, uh, which was a big Sunday night show. They both performing on the same bill. And John fell for her. The, the pictures tell the story. There are some in the book. And Alma tragically fell sick at the age of 34. She developed ovarian cancer, she died. John was utterly heartbroken. And on the rebound, he met Yoko. He went to the Indica Gallery one night and there was a strangely exotic, long-haired Japanese woman up a ladder, sticking something to the ceiling. And they got chatting and all of her art seemed to John a bit of a joke. It was installation art, you know, there, there, were, there was an apple and there was a nail, you could hammer the nail into the wall. And so they struck up this exchange and Yoko gave as good as she got. 
John was inclined to make fun of everybody, especially in a situation like that. But Yoko had the responses. She was a very educated, very intelligent person. And he instantly felt that he'd met his match. And thereafter, it was a question of getting rid of Cynthia, mm -hmm. which he did in quite a cruel way by waiting until Cynthia went away and then shipping Yoko in and arranging it so that Cynthia would come back and walk in on them, which mm -hmm. was a very unkind and cowardly thing to do. You, you, you met her several times and have interviewed Cynthia, didn't you? Yes, yeah. Do you still love John even despite that? She said she did. Uh, I think it was a bit of a blind love. I think the love was something of a fantasy as well. I think love is very much a reciprocal arrangement and it's impossible to really love somebody who isn't loving you back. And John felt with Yoko that he'd met his soulmate and Cynthia even said she could see that. So she couldn't fight with it. She couldn't fight to get him back because he'd found somebody who was right for him. Was she like a new mother figure um, to replace Julia? Very much so, yeah. She was about eight years older than John. And more or less from the beginning, he addressed her as mother, which wasn't just the northern thing of when you get married to a woman, you, you start to call her mother because the kids come along. And that tends to be uh, how husbands address, or it did used to be, how husbands would address their, their women in the north. But yeah, there was a gap to fill. And I, I felt very strongly that Yoko did perceive the gap in the market and that she set out to fill it. She could see what John needed and she decided to become that in order to win him. And then she could assert herself in other ways. But the Beatles didn't like it. And a lot of the Beatles fans didn't because she was uh, seen as a distraction from when they were they're writing, you know, their album, she would sit on his lap and come into the studio. But uh, you, you seem to suggest that, um, you know, Sergeant Pepper in 67 was mostly Paul, and then the subsequent albums perhaps were driven by him, whereas John had been very much the leader of the Beatles in the early days. The, ta the tables were turned and he'd become pretty bored of the Beatles, perhaps by, well, certainly after they gave up touring, he felt that he wanted out then, I think. He was sick of it, he'd had enough, and poor Yoko got the blame, didn't she, all the years for having broken up the Beatles, that was the phrase. The Beatles were broken already. Once they came off the road, they went into the studio, they were experimenting with different techniques, uh, with the very limited technology that was around at that time. John very quickly grew bored with the studio scenario. And it's a bit of a pressure cooker as well, as you well know, to, to be in a studio, a windowless space with, four creative brains all vying with each other for attention and I want the A side, you have the B side and, and all of that, you know, all of the input, they, they fight over the air that they breathe and John had enough of that very quickly and wanted out. It could well be, and I pose this question in the book, that John and Yoko colluded together, that she would be the excuse, the reason. She could be the cause for John walking away from the Beatles. She might have quite enjoyed that role in a perverse kind of way. Yeah, I'll be to blame. Blame it on me. And uh, then you can get out. And of course, the thing he wanted more than anything was to start working with other musicians and mm. playing on stage specifically with other musicians, not just those other three. Okay, well, we don't have time to fill in all the other details, of course, but, um, you know, he got very much involved in the peace movement and they did the Amsterdam Hotel thing and they did the bagism, uh, bagism and the peace thing in the hotel in Montreal, um, which was all really, really interesting. But um, why, tell us why, well, I know why, because you say in the book, John and Yoko went to live in America. She was trying to find her daughter from her first marriage to Tony Cox, yeah? Well, it was actually her second marriage, uh, but yes, they had a daughter, Kiyoko, who was eight, the same age as Julian. And uh, to begin with, the relationship was quite cordial between the two couples, John and Yoko and Tony and Melinda, his new partner, and they would share Kiyoko. They would take her back and forth uh, between the two families. But Tony Cox spent some time down at Tittenhouse Park, where John and Yoko were now living. Uh, in Ascot and saw drug taking, witnessed quite a lot of bad behaviour and decided that this was an unhealthy environment for his daughter to be in. So he legged it with her to Mallorca. John and Yoko got wind of that. They went there and they snatched her out of her new little school 
at which point the police were called and there was a court hearing, an immediate court hearing, during which Yoko was awarded custody of her child. But before she had the chance to take her child back with her to England, Tony and Melinda ran off with her again. And word came that they were in America. So John and Yoko went to New York to try and get a court hearing to get custody of the child, which they won on the understanding and the basis that they would remain living in America and would bring her up there so that her father could have access to her. But the tragedy was they never got her back, ever. So John never saw his stepdaughter again. And Yoko only met her own child again when Kiyoko was in her 30s and had had a baby of her own. And Kyoko's husband by then had said, you can't really be bringing a child into the world without having made peace with your own mother. But it was such, such a tragedy. And it also had a knock-on effect on Julian because Yoko couldn't be a, she couldn't bear to be around children, given that her own child had been taken away. Why should I have Julian? Why should I look after him when I haven't got my own daughter? So that had a bad effect on John's relationship with his son. It's a tragedy all round, isn't it, really? Was, was uh, on that point, would be, did Julian make it up or did John make it up with Julian at all in, in, in the New York years? There was a moment uh, when May Pang, you know, the lost weekend, when things weren't going so well between John and Yoko. So Yoko bizarrely arranged for one of their young assistants called May Pang to accompany John to Los Angeles and have what came to be known as the lost weekend that lasted between 14 and 18 months, depending on where you read it. Uh, and May was very keen that John should have contact with his son. So she arranged for him and Cynthia to come over to Los Angeles. They went to Disneyland, all that kind of thing. And then when they were living back in New York, Julian came again and stayed with them. And May was very kind to him. Mm. So she was trying desperately to patch up that relationship between Julian and John and it was going quite well but that time Julian went home and then there was an estrangement and then John died. And and um, you interviewed May Pang didn't you? Yes. She's what about 80 now? No she's not as old as that I think she's about 70 now actually. Um, she had a hard life May really because she let her apartment go to be with John and then, of course, they lived together over on the West Coast, back in, in New York. He rented an apartment. They built a life. She wasn't receiving a salary, which she had been previously because she was with working with John and Yoko. But during the John years, that stopped. So she didn't have an income. When he decided to go back to Yoko, she didn't have a home. She had no roof over her head and no provision was made for her, which I thought was desperately terrible. I don't know why she went along with it, you know. Um, she was 22 he, and she was in awe of her employer. Yeah, but he used her for sex, obviously, and he was... Obviously, a, yeah. You know, but he very, grew tired and then he wanted to, grow, to go home. And nothing was done for me, which I hmm. think is a shameful scenario, really. That's a very dark sort of blot on John's history. I'm conscious of the time and I want to just therefore move a bit forward because... On, on that point, therefore, while John was away with May Pang, probably Yoko had relationships with other men, probably, yeah? There was a man, a particular man, Sam Havatoy, who worked for the Lennons as an interior designer, and Yoko was very interested in him and did pursue a relationship with him. And in mm -hmm. fact, was with him the night John was killed. She more or less shipped him into the Dakota building the night John was murdered. And they were then subsequently together for about 20 years, so twice the length of time that John and Yoko spent together. And there was a weird scenario, according to Andy Peebles, who conducted the last interview with John by a British broadcaster before he died. And Andy met Sam Havertoy and he said it was odd because Yoko was dressing him in John's clothes and had his hair cut to look like John and so on. So there was an obsession with the entity of John Lennon, as far as Yoko was concerned, but maybe the reality of John Lennon by this time was impossible for her to live with. So she created a new one. Uh, why was it impossible for her to, you know, then? I think she had, she had idealised John and there was a lot of heroin taking going on at this time on both their parts. 
and this had a bad effect on both of them. John withdrew from public life for more than just one reason, which was to bake bread and bring up the baby. He was struggling with addiction at that time, but he didn't quit making music. That was widely put around at the time that he, he turned his back on his musical career. He hadn't. He was experimenting and recording things, but he just wasn't in a position health-wise to be public about it. Well, he played on David Bowie's Fame record, didn't he? And, uh, you know, several years before that was the Oklahoma Band and the live concert with Elton John. But Andy Peebles posed to you in his interview for the book um, a very interesting question. Um, you mentioned, the, you know, the bread making and bringing up Sean and the house husband years. And one of the records on Double Fantasy, the album that came out just before his death, was just like starting over. And the media said, well, you know, yeah, this was the new start that Leonard had been seeking. He put music on the backbone. That was the, the, the perceived perception of it. And uh, Andy wondered whether it was just a marketing tool, the House of Husband Years, to sell the new album. What do you think? Yeah, Andy, Andy was very cynical. He felt he'd been used. And duped was the word that he used, actually. He thought that they had engineered this first interview with the BBC for 10 years between, uh, as it turned out, Andy Peebles. There was a list of people it could have been, but it did turn out to be Andy and John and Jochen. And he felt that what they were selling to him afterwards, he felt this, that it was fake, that they weren't really as conjoined as they were presenting and that they were giving the world this impression of their very cemented relationship and everything they had to look forward to in order to sell this album, which most people felt wasn't his best. There are some good tracks on it. Beautiful Boy is lovely and obviously just like starting over is fantastic. Um, but it wasn't as an entity, as a whole album, it wasn't the best thing John Lennon ever did. But of course it went, it skyrocketed. It, it went huge around the world because he did the best thing that a rock star can ever do, which is die young, uh, if you want to guarantee sales. It's a cynical way of looking at it, but this is what happened. Yeah, and, and, and on the first anniversary after his death in 81, and he went back to interview Yoko again, I think, and, and, and for several years went and was, you know, friends and tried to help Sean, and then she dropped him and has never, he's never heard from her for several years. Because well, he left the BBC and what yeah. she was trying to construct was an ongoing relationship with the BBC because John was so in love with the BBC. It was one of the things he missed the most about living in the UK. And the BBC World Service, which Margaret Thatcher threatened at that time, wanting to reduce it and to uh, drop expenditure on that, John thought this was an outrage because this was the empire, this was colonial Britain, and that's what he'd grown up on. Also, you were able to speak to the wife of the man that shot John Lennon, Mark Chapman. She's in Hawaii. Yes. She is, yeah. Gloria, Gloria Hiroko Chapman is her name. Yeah, she's a, she's a religious lady. Uh, she steadfastly remains married to Mark and she refused. A lot of her friends advised her to divorce him. She wouldn't because she conversed with her God and concluded that the right thing to do was to stand by him. So she sees him now for about 44 days a year. They have conjugal visits in a caravan in the Wende Correctional Facility where he lives, is incarcerated. And I can't see a time when he'll ever be released. But she knew what he wanted to do, didn't she? She, I don't know if she was in on it, but he talked about this for several weeks, hadn't he? Or even maybe longer. She did come out latterly, so quite many years after John had died, to say that, that she knew about it. I wonder whether that's true or whether, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? And did she know? She seemed to be admitting some sort of guilt there, which I wonder if that was an ill-advised thing to say. So your book is called Who Killed John Lennon? We talked about the lives, the loves and the deaths of the greatest rock star. 
and uh, so this this is a wonderful book. This is packed with loads and loads of really interesting stories and quotes. One of which is maybe sixties John was a fake, seventies John was energetic and, and powerful with Yoko. Who killed him really? Other than well, that's that's what the book set out to discover. So please read the book and find out. What's to decide? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. come in there because I've got a few questions. Actually, you've answered. I mean, that's a, that's very much one question that came from uh, someone in the audience. Um, we, yeah, why the title of the book? Um, so let's let's do some questions from the audience. Thank you uh, for those who've sent through. Um, did Mimi ever comment on how she felt about John going back to Julia? Um, I think Claire's giving that a view that I imagine she was quite hurt. She was cross about it. Yeah, she was um, affronted, as Mimi would be, because she liked to be in control. And to, for John to have done this behind her back was not a good thing at all. Uh, Mimi had her ways of punishing John as well. Um, but they did stay very close. And when John went to New York and never came back, he'd always intended to, but just never came back, they stayed in touch. He called her every week and they would talk for an hour on the phone. And he had her send over a lot of belongings from his childhood, the, the household china and linens and his school books, his uniforms, all of that kind of thing. Mimi swore blind at the end of her life that John had come back to visit her by some means, whether he sailed into Southampton, crossed somebody's palm with silver. But she wasn't demented at the end. And she was convinced, she was utterly convinced that he'd been back one last time to see her. Well, he could have been arrested if he'd been recognised, if it, if it actually happened, right? Or if he was in some sort of disguise, who knows? I mean, if you've got that much money, he was the richest guy in the world. He was the most famous guy in the world. There are disguises. You know, we don't know. No one knows. It's, a, it's an open question. Um, how much do you feel the current perception of John is due to the reinvention by Yoko? Well, she's kept the flame alive, hasn't she? And as each anniversary has come round, there has been some sort of commemoration. Um, there has been in Liverpool this amazing this double fantasy exhibition with a lot of artefacts and uh, items of clothing, photographs, lyrics, bits of film, interactive things for people to get involved in. So I, I feel that single handedly she has done everything to keep John alive and to keep interest in him afloat. Well, the music has done its share as well. Mm. Yes. I think the next one raises a few questions about, um, uh, this is from Margaret actually, do you consider John to be the most talented and creative of the Beatles? I mean, that's obviously a loaded question because I, I, I suspect um, Paul McCartney might have a throw in that, in that discussion, but... Um, I think they were the perfect match because John had the sound bite. He had that call. He'd be writing advertising slogans if he were around today. You know, he had that ability to encapsulate a message in as few words as possible, which is a, a vital component. Whereas Paul was infinitely more melodic and the more instinctive songwriter, the more musical of the two. So obviously joined together, they were a match made in heaven. I personally felt they were never as, as musical, as prolific, as talented as separate individuals as they were together. So really that chemistry, that so much of the songwriting depended on the chemistry. Um, yes. There's not really anything that I could think, I was a massive Wings fan. I came in at Wings and worked my way backwards because I was too young to experience the Beatles in real time. And I think Wings came closest to the brilliance of the Beatles. Um, John Lennon Plastic Ono Band for me was a peak of, jo of John's individual music. It's completely subjective, isn't it? There are, are going to be as many views on this subject. We could be here for the next year. Yeah, I mean, who would, who would Elton John be without Bernie Taupin? I don't know. Well, exactly. And lots of people out there still think that Elton wrote all the words. <laughs> and, um... I mean, there was a big commentary on, on, I saw a Facebook commentary about Bob Dylan and um, so many uh, just don't view him uh, as having anything near the talent of any, any of the 
um, any of the names we're discussing here, but but actually as an individual, he's managed to um, his his legacy is extraordinary, given that he he didn't die young and uh, he's managed to produce. So I would sorry that was just a, that was an aside, given uh, what what I saw on um, on Facebook this morning. But mm -hmm. what, what are your views on Bob Dylan, by the way? <laughs> Again, a bit too young to to have. You know, I think it related to the time when one was young. The music that was around when we were waking up to music is, is what we relate to most. Yeah. So for me, Paul McCartney and his Wings incarnation, Elton John, Cat Stevens, would be the music that resonates with me, both, both musically and lyrically. Um, those messages, you know when you're young and you're malleable and open to suggestions of all kinds, and I can hear that music now and also the music my father played which was stuff like Simon and Garfunkel you know if something comes on that um, I instantly recognize and I'm cast right back to that period of time and I think we all have our own music that does that to us so Bob Dylan doesn't do that for me because that wasn't my era it was yeah, yeah, one yeah. before me you met uh, David Bowie when you were five didn't you yeah, although it didn't make much impression on me because uh, I couldn't really care less who he was at that point. And I met Mark Boland that one time with David. My friend at school, her mother was a photographer on a local rag, a newspaper, and they were babysitting me one Sunday afternoon. And this was her assignment to go along to the arts lab at the Three Tons pub in Beckenham High Street and take some pictures of Bowie was hosting a, a sort of folk afternoon. Um, didn't make any impression on me at all, really. I wish that I'd been aware enough to know that I was in the presence of Mark Bolan, who was my great hero when I was a young teenager. Wow. wow. OK, so we haven't got very long left, but um, I'll, 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 there's one more question here, and then I might leave um, uh, Mike to just give a little closing uh, piece about um, about how much you enjoyed the book. So this is a lovely question, uh, and it's a fitting uh, fitting last one. You, you've painted the picture of a flawed individual, uh, difficult relationships, drugs, absent father. Um, do you like him? Good question. I love him, <laughs> and I fell in love with him while I was writing the book because the more I found out about why he was the way he was, the more I empathized with him and felt sympathy for him, the more I wanted to mother him. I wanted to save him. And I suppose I had the same feeling towards him that Yoko must have had. And therefore, yes, I do like him very much. I completely understand, I hope, why he was the way he was. And I wish he were here today. I wish he could, I could meet him. Would he still be relevant today if he was here? Would he still be making uh, you know, maybe being an activist and political comments and so on? Absolutely. We need John Lennon more than ever. We need that caustic wit. We need that outspokenness. We need this guy who championed the causes of, of peace and love. We need someone to poke fun at our politicians in a completely detached way, to talk to us on a level about the pandemic and about Brexit and to make sense of the nonsense. We, I think he would have taken full advantage of social media. He'd have been all over Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and he would have gone on television and he would have talked sense because he always did. There was something about John Lennon that everybody could relate to, even if you didn't agree with his message. And we don't have characters like that anymore, and we really need them. And you, you met Paul last year in Liverpool, I think. Uh, he, mm. he was giving away the certificates to what, to graduates at um, his School of Performing Arts? Yeah, so LIPA, which is the Liverpool Institute of Performing Arts, is housed in his old grammar school which uh, when it was closing down because there weren't enough kids to keep it going, he snapped it up and they developed it as a performing arts school. And I was invited to go to the graduation ceremony last year and we were sent um, a letter, all the attendees warning us not to approach Sir Paul McCartney, not to try and talk to him, not to jump up and try and get selfies with him or anything. So we were all terribly well behaved. But in fact, he came over to me and he uh, began a conversation with me about his late wife, Linda, because he knew that I'd worked with her on a book that was never published. And we had a long discourse and I was very fortunate 
to get that. And afterwards, when the ceremony was over, we were all back in the green room and everyone's saying, no pictures, don't approach Paul for any pictures. He came over to me, put his arm around my shoulder. Come on, Leslie Ann. And he just stood there. And then, of course, everybody rushed to take the pictures. And I was so glad to get that. And it's in the book. Did, did you have the book? Did you know that you were writing the book and did you get some quotes for the book from him then? Yeah, he knew. Uh, not specific quotes, but um, a lot of insight. I didn't want to quote him in a situation where I wasn't in a position to record him or take down notes because quotes have to be accurate. Otherwise, they're hearsay. Uh, but I was able to use what he told me to inform what I wrote, yeah. New album's coming out this Friday. Now, um, you think um, people will stop going to visit the places of Lennon's life in Liverpool and possibly New York and no longer listen to his music in the future? Or is it always going to be with us long after we've all gone too? I don't see it happening anytime soon. It's hard to say that it won't ever happen. But when I was in Liverpool and I went to John's house and I went to Paul's house, there is a wonderful National Trust visit you can do on a little minibus and go inside their homes where those songs were written. It's incredibly moving to do that. I cried in both their houses, standing in John Lennon's bedroom, looking out on that side where his mum died, sitting in Paul McCartney's front room on the very sofa where he composed songs. It's, he, Bob Dylan did that, by the way. He, he got thrown off the minibus. They thought he was a tramp. Yeah an imposter. Um, quite a few uh, well-known artists have done that visit because it's so inspiring. Bruce Springsteen might have done. Yeah, he yeah. did. Debbie Harry went as well. But I, they're so well attended. They're so sold out all the time, or at least in normal times. And when you go to Strawberry Fields and you stand at the mosaic and you're surrounded by people, sometimes hundreds of people there, especially at sundown, eating a sandwich, having a beer, putting flowers, having pictures taken. And these are young people. They're not old people who were around during John's lifetime. They're not people like us, but they're young people who have discovered the music and John Lennon means something to them. So as long as they're bringing those babies and those toddlers and those kids are growing up on John Lennon, I can't see that dying anytime soon. Well, I went nine years ago and like you, I thought he was extraordinary. Um, and they're all the, you know, day, John wrote something called the Daily Howl, which is newspaper of his musings and his jokes and his things. And all those, or many of those originals are in his bedroom, aren't they? At Mendes. Yeah. It is, I, I, I thoroughly recommend that trip. Anyone who hasn't been, please go, please book yourself, however long it takes to get there. It's amazing. Nothing I can tell you about it. It will prepare you for how it feels to be inside their homes. At the I, end think it'll always, I think it'll always um, last, because there's a city now behind it. I mean, Liverpool um, has, has created a, a whole tourism world of, uh, a, 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 around it. I mean, I've, I've done the visit to, the, even though the, um, one or two of the venues are no longer the same locations. At least they're, um, uh, they've got the spirit of it anyway. But yeah. At least they're there. And there are the, the taxi tours as well, the black taxi tours. Some of these guys are amazing. They'll spend an entire day with you and take you around to all the Beatles locations. And it, it is very moving. Mm. Uh, and we can be very proud of that. I know we're not in Liverpool, but the Beatles also lived in London and they were ours. We yeah. gave them to the world, so yeah, we can be proud of that. Well, I was nine in 1964, and obviously we only had access to hearing the Beatles on some pirate radio and, and Radio Luxembourg before the BBC went with it. And um, my, my, my dad was in a kind of an amateur dramatic group, and they thought it was hilarious to, to dress up as the Beatles with fake wigs <laughs> at, at one, some evening that they had, and, and I was allowed to stay up and watch that, you know. And um, it was quite interesting that, that you know, my, my mum and dad would be very, very classical music fans and brought up with the crooners. And when rock and roll got edgier and harder with the Who and the Stones and the Kinks, didn't like that at all. But obviously they, they were enchanced by the charm of the Fab Four. So Brian Epstein got all of that right. Without that, maybe they wouldn't go on to be the phenomenal. Absolutely. But just on the music, you know, the, the change in what they did between 65 and 69 in four years was so different from the period between 62 and, 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 and 65. You know, they changed so much musically and, and in the sound once they got off the touring sort of uh, conveyor belt. Well, they didn't have and you put in the back end. 
Yeah, it was about inspiration. And when you're on the road hammering out the hits, quick, write another album, write some more singles, quick, get back on the road and flog those. And then quick, go and write some more. They were much of a muchness, the songs at that point. So they really needed that time away and to have a space and then to go again and to find their inspiration, which, and they're a bit more mature by this time. So it, it really pieces together the story with hindsight as yeah. to how their music developed. And you, yeah, and you write, you know, obviously for people that maybe are new to the music, the, the chronology of their albums as the Fab Four and you put in some of your own favourite tracks at the end of the book. And uh, you also do a really interesting summary of the major players in the whole of the story that we've been discussing tonight in terms of the chronology, who they are and, and when they were around. Um, so much more we could talk about, but um, it's really good to have you with us. Thank do you, you think, one final question, because the last time we spoke, we were speaking about Mark Bolan in 2017 on the 40th anniversary of his death too. And um, my, I asked you whether, you whether Bolan thought that he was going to die young, and the answer was yes, and there were some mm. clues. Do you, you sort of alluded a couple of times in this book, I think, Leslie Ann, that whether Lennon thought that um, he might die young or prematurely as well, right? I don't think he had much respect for life. And Cynthia certainly said there was an air about John where he didn't really care whether he lived or died. So he, he was alive, he just lived, he did what came along, but he didn't much care. Um, and I think that was a theme throughout his life. <laughs> so, you know, for all we know, John was a very perverse kind of person in many ways, on many levels he might actually find really appealing the fact that he was taken out in such a dramatic way and that his life ended with such tragedy because we're never going to forget it and we're still talking about it today and probably will for the rest of our lives so he may just have liked the idea of an ending like that. who knows <laughs> Yeah, well, as I say, it's a terrific book and uh, it's available from our Tring Bookshop on the High Street from tomorrow morning, right? Thank Good. you. No, thank much. you, Mike. Thank you, um, Leslie, and to uh, both of you for a wonderful hour. That's been fantastic. Really enjoyed that. Uh, thank you to the audience. Um, uh, books are obviously in the shop and uh, I'll be posting out those that wanted postal um, requested posters that's all going to go tomorrow so uh, you, you'll get them before Christmas and uh, all to say just thank you and um, we will see you um, next time for our, well we've got an event tomorrow um, where we're um, in fact we've got events tomorrow and on uh, on Wednesday we're talking tomorrow to David Hepworth in fact Mike thank you Mike you're doing uh, that interview as well and then on Wednesday we're talking to James Holland um, about Sicily 43 which um, uh, which is the first first assault on Fortress Europe, um, which um, is the start of the end of World War Two. But uh, thank you again to everyone, and uh, um, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lizzie Ann. Thank care. you very much. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.